Good morning. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up to Ruth chapter four. If we have not met yet, my name is David and I'm the group's pastor here. Y'all, I, I love that song. All my life, he has been faithful. All my life, he has been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. There's so much hope in that song. There's so much hope in God's goodness in that song when we sing. You know, it's interesting, the book of Ruth is actually the first book in the Bible where the word hope appears. Seven books into scripture, and the first time the word hope appears is in the book of Ruth. It's the story of Ruth. It's it's a story of hope for people in, in incredibly dark places. It's a story of how someone keeps pressing in how someone keeps holding on, how someone keeps being faithful, even when it seems like the darkness is creeping in, even when it seems like there's just a hopeless situation, there's no point to it anymore, I can't do this anymore. The story of Ruth is a story of God's goodness. It's a story of God's hope and that it's there that all our lives he has been faithful, that all our lives he has been so, so good. With every breath that we are able, we'll sing of the goodness of God. So I don't know how you came in here this morning. Some of you came in here with some really fun, exciting prospects for the future. Some of you came in here dreading the pain of the future. But what I believe this morning, and looking at this text this past week, what I believe this morning is that my assignment in Ruth chapter four is to tell you that God's goodness that we just sang about, it's real, it's true, it's there, and his plans are for your good. And they are greater than anything you could ever see or imagine. See, the story of Ruth, it's, it's, this is where we've been for the past few weeks, and we're in chapter four, finishing it up today. The story of Ruth is a story of how someone goes from emptiness to fulfillment, from death to to life. If you remember in the very first week when, when Ivy preached in Ruth chapter one, verse 21, Naomi said this, she said, I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. She loses her husband, she loses her sons, she loses hope, the goodness of God is is gone, it seems like. And yet, after a story of incredible twists and turns, unbelievable sadness and loss, Naomi ends the book not in death, but in life, not in empty, but in full. And I know, not everyone in here is going to be in Ruth 4 today. Not everyone walks into this room content, filled up, happy ending. I know that. Some of you find yourself in Ruth 1 today, where you're you're starting something new. You're leaving Moab. Some of you find yourself in Ruth chapter 2. Or you're just slogging through the fields, you're, you're sweating it out in the fields. Some of you are in chapter three where you're just trying to figure out next steps. But again, regardless of how you came in here today, regardless of the difficulty or the darkness that you're facing, I'm here to tell you this morning that the goodness of God, it's real, it's true, and his plans are for your good and they are greater than anything you could ever imagine. So we're gonna get into Ruth chapter four this morning, but before we get into the word of God, let's talk to the God of the word and ask him to help us understand it and be transformed by it. Let's pray. God, we love you and we're grateful that you have given us this book of Ruth. I pray that it wouldn't be my words today, it would be yours, that the spirit would use your word to transform the hearts of your people May I not be a hindrance to that. In Jesus' name, amen. 
All right, so we're gonna pick up the story in Ruth chapter four with Boaz and Ruth. They've agreed to get married, but there's a little hitch. Uh, they gotta kind of solve an issue because back then, uh, when there was someone who was closer in relation uh, to the married person, they had first dibs on the marriage. And so Boaz has gone to, to the city gate to wait for this guy who needs to be contacted first. So this is verse one. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friends, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. And he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Now, I'm sure this guy is thinking, hey, it's a pretty sweet deal. I get some land here. It's not like they're making any more land in Israel. Maybe I get to add this to my family's land. This is, this is awesome. But then Boaz says this in verse five. He says, then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. So this is Boaz rather casually mentioning to this guy, okay, well, here's the rest of the deal. Ruth comes with the land. So you get the land, you get Ruth the Moabite. To which this guy says, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption for yourself, or I cannot redeem it. Gary kind of explained this last week. To take on Ruth as a wife, to marry Ruth, is going to be an incredible financial risk. But also, if you, if you kind of read between the lines of the text, when Boaz says, oh, by the way, she's also a Moabite, this guy's probably thinking, wait, she's a Moabite? What if she got some crazy Moabite cousins? And they all wanna start moving here, and then I gotta take care of them. And so this guy's like, I, you know, I, I prayed about this. I just, I kinda had this check in my spirit. I don't feel led to do this, so I think I'm gonna pass. And Boaz then, after that, he, he steps up, he follows through, and he redeems Ruth, Naomi, in the land. Now here's verse 11. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephratah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of that offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. There are only two times in the entire book of Ruth, where God is the, is the subject of a verb. What that means is that there are only two times in the entire four chapters of Ruth where God actually does something directly. This is one of them. It's the very end of the book. Ruth had been in Moab for 10 years, childless, and then all of a sudden God provides a baby here. The second one is at the very beginning of the book of Ruth in Ruth 1.6. Um, Naomi and Ruth, they leave Moab because they heard God had provided food for his people. So, so think about what you've got here. You, you've got the beginning of the book, God is providing food for his people. The end of the book, God's providing a baby for his people. But the way that Ruth is set up is that in that middle part, God's not really doing anything directly. In fact, God doesn't do anything directly at all. And yet, when you get to Ruth chapter four, what you see is the hand of God has been orchestrating this whole story. Like Ruth just so happened to find herself in Boaz's field. Boaz just so happened to be able and willing to redeem Ruth. Theologians call this the providence of God. The providence of God our big idea this morning is that God's plans are for your good and they are greater than anything you could ever see or imagine. And one of the reasons that you can know that, providence of God. Now, when I'm talking about providence, I'm not talking about the city in Rhode Island. 
What I'm talking about with providence and what theologians have predominantly meant over, uh, over the years is, is simply this. Providence of God is that God continues to uphold, guide, and care for his creation. The providence of God is God working to continually uphold, guide, and care for his creation. In essence, what providence says is that which God creates, God continues to care for. So let me see if I can explain it like this. I love going to the grocery store, especially with my kids. And the reason that I love going to the grocery store with my kids is because one of the things we do is we get those grocery carts that look like race cars. Are, are you familiar with this? There, it's, especially at HEB, you, you've got a grocery cart and there's like kind of a race car in it and there's steering wheels. And so what we'll do is we'll play the game where they steer and I take them you know, where they steer. We play race car. And so if they steer right, I take them right. If they steer left, I take them left. If they steer into the strawberry or the blueberry stand, we'll go right into the strawberry or blueberry stand because we're, we're very, very serious about this game. Now, I, I want you to enter into the mind of the two-year-old with me for just a moment, though. Because I'm, I'm committed to go where she steers, she steers right, I go right. She steers left, I go left. And because I'm committed to go where she steers, she thinks that she's in control. And we have this great time, it's fun, it's awesome. But at some point in the game, this happens every single time, at some point in the game, she's gonna steer right and I'm gonna take us left. And she's gonna get frustrated and she's gonna steer harder to the right and I'm gonna take us to the left. Now why am I taking us to the left? Because I got a grocery list. And if we want to get out of the grocery store, we actually have to get through the aisles and we, we can't play race car all day. I, I'm, I'm absolutely there for the race car driving, 100%. It's great, it's fun. But I've got a bigger purpose than actually being at the grocery store of some things that I, I need to accomplish. You see, the, the two-year-old was never actually in control. Two-year-old was content when we were going to the right and I was taking us to the right, we're going to the left, and I was taking us to the left, but the two-year-old was never in control. And listen to me, in the same way, the providence of God says that no matter what you're going through, no matter how you came into this room this morning, God is steering your life to accomplish his purposes. He has not taken his hands off of the shopping cart, and it, you may wanna turn right, with every bit of you, you may want to turn right and it makes no sense to you why you're going left. And yet God's providence still remains. He is still upholding you, still guiding you, still caring for you. And that means that no matter how dark it is, how difficult it is, no matter what, his plans are for your good and they are greater than anything you could ever imagine. But don't stop there. Because let's actually play this out. Like what if you actually believe the providence of God? What if you actually believe this? That there was a God who was actually upholding, guiding, and caring for everything in creation, including you. Think of how your fears could be alleviated. Because if the God who is upholding, guiding, and caring the universe, if that God is for you, who could be against you? See, if you believe in providence, if you actually believe in providence, it'll change your life. Maybe this will help. Um, John, the disciple of Jesus, when he was um, exiled on the island of Patmos, he wrote the book of Revelation. Jesus came to visit him on the island of Patmos in the middle of the Mediterranean. When John was on the earth with Jesus, when he was one of his disciples and following Jesus around Israel, John and Jesus were close. One could make the case that they were BFFs. I mean, John wrote a book of the Bible called John. And in that book, he said he was the disciple who Jesus loved. Now that's saying that your relationship is, is very close. John and Jesus, very tight. How do you think the reunion is going to be on Patmos, after Jesus is resurrected, after Jesus is ascended, he comes to visit John. How do you think that reunion is going to play out? Big hug? 
High five. I'll let John tell you himself how it actually played out. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. His face was like the shining sun in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. When John saw Jesus in all of his glory, he was terrified and he fell down as though he were dead. Not a figure of speech, by the way. He literally thought he was going to die. Now, why did Jesus choose to appear to John like this? I think it's because John needed to know that Jesus was bigger than anything he was ever going to face. So Thomas Watson, he was, a, he was a Puritan in the 1600s and he wrote a, a, a book called The Body of Divinity and, and in that book he had this really interesting quote about providence. He said this, he said, let providence be an antidote against fear because nothing comes to pass but what is ordained by God's decree and ordered by his providence. Listen, providence demands that you believe in a God who is actually capable of upholding, guiding, and caring for all creation. It demands that you actually believe in a big God who is bigger than anything that you're ever going to face or that you're currently facing right now. That's why Jesus appeared to John like this, because the church, the church was about to go through an incredible time of persecution. And if the church was going to have, to have the faith to endure, if it was gonna have the hope to endure, Jesus knew that the only thing that was going to sustain his people and give them hope to endure was a vision of himself more powerful over it all. Because if they were going to have the hope to endure the terrors of the tribulation, they were going to have to see that Jesus was more powerful than the tribulation was terrible. They did not need a God who was going to simply be the missing piece to their dissatisfied suburban lives. They did not need a Jesus who was going to just give them some life advice and some, some trite platitudes or just promise them a blissful afterlife. What they needed was the God of the universe who providentially upheld, guided, and cared for everything in all of creation. Do you believe in that God? Man, I just think sometimes, I could be totally off here, but I think sometimes that some of the reasons why we have so much fear is because we've never actually seen God like this. Because when life caves in on us, whether it's, it's the darkness is, is creeping in, and whether it's the horseman of the apocalypse, or it's a bad diagnosis, or a broken relationship, we, what we really need is a big God who is bigger than anything we'll ever face in our lives. What we need is a God of infinite glory who is upholding, guiding, and caring for us through his providence, a God who has promised to marshal every molecule for his glory and for your good, a God who stands behind your salvation and will let nothing come in between his plan for your good and for his glory. Let's keep going to verse 17. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now there are the generations of Perez. Uh, Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Amenadab, Amenadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon swam upstream and fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David, who we know as the greatest king in Israel up to that point. Let me give you one more reason why we can know that God's plans are for our good, because, why we can know they're better than anything we could ever see or imagine. One is providence. Two is that our God is a prayer answering God. He's a prayer answering God. This is really fascinating. It, it actually, it blew my mind when I, I figured this out. Did you know that everything that happens in the book of Ruth is an answer to prayer? Everything, everything that happens in the book of Ruth has its cause in one of the character's prayer requests. 
If you don't believe me, I'll, I'll show you. In Ruth 1, 9, when Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah are about to leave Moab, if, if you remember, Naomi prays this, that the Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Well, that happened. I'm sure Naomi in her wildest dreams had no idea that it was gonna be in Israel with Boaz, who's essentially the, the prototype for self-sacrificing, God-honoring biblical masculinity, but it happened. When Boaz prayed this in, in Ruth 2.12, He's, he prayed for Ruth that a full reward be given to her by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Pretty sure that Boaz had no idea that he was going to be the answer to that prayer, but it happened. And then we get to Ruth 4, and God answers another prayer in ways that are greater than anything we could ever see, anything that we ever could imagine. So look back at Ruth 4, 11. Boaz has done the deal. There are witnesses who have attested to him as being the rightful redeemer. And what they say is this, they say, we are witnesses, may the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. Great blessing. Rachel and Leah, they were the wives of Jacob. Their kids, along with some other kids, form the 12 tribes of Israel, kind of the 12 founding families of Israel. Rachel and Leah, founding mothers of Israel, great blessing, great wedding toast. But then they, they say this, they say, may you act worthily in Ephratah, and be renowned in Bethlehem, and may your house be like the house of Perez, underline that, we're gonna come back to it, whom Tamar bore to Judah, and because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this woman. In Hebrew, the word Perez, the name Perez means bursting forth. Genesis 38, Perez, he's got a twin named Zerah, and when they're born, Zerah sticks his hand out first, but he pulls it back. Perez then bursts forth, and, and he's, and he's born first. That's what Genesis 38 tells us about Perez. So essentially what these, these witnesses are praying is that the offspring, the descendants, the kids, the grandkids, the great grandkids of Ruth and Boaz, they would burst forth, that they would do great things, that they would be first, they would be important. And, and like all the other prayers in the book of Ruth, it happens. Ruth in Boaz, their great-grandson is King David, the greatest king Israel has ever known. But, but there's something deeper that's going on here. Because the prayer answering God, he, he's got a plan that's greater than anything anyone could ever imagine. Because years and years and years later, there would be another child who would burst forth on the pages of history. He would also be renowned in Bethlehem. They would even call him the son of David. Flip over in your Bibles to, to Matthew chapter one. It's the very first page of the New Testament. Matthew one, it's the genealogy of Jesus, the family line of Jesus. And now look at verse three in Matthew uh, chapter one. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez, heard that name before. Then if you skip down to verse five, Sam and the father of Boaz by Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, Jesse the father of David the king. Then 28 generations, or the biblical term is begets, 28 begets later, Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. What do we make of this here? The prayer answering God is taking this simple prayer of blessing by these witnesses and he's saying, okay, I see your bursting forth prayer request and yeah, your great grandson is absolutely going to burst forth and he's gonna be the king of Israel, absolutely. But I'll do you one better because Ruth, you're going to burst forth into the royal genealogy of my son, the true redeemer of the world. Do you see that? God takes 
Ruth, who had everything stacked up against her in this world. She was a poor, obscure, childless widow from a hated race. She was a woman in a time when women were not treated equally. She's a gender outsider, a social outsider, an ethnic outsider, and God used her to bring the true redeemer, Jesus Christ, into the world. God is a prayer answering God. So here's my question to you. What are you praying for? What are you praying for God to move on? Are you praying at all? Let me give you just two quick things of application uh, before we we wrap up here that you could actually apply this week uh, as you're praying. I want you to notice two things about these prayers in Ruth in terms of application. One is that these are simple prayers. Don't detect a lot of religious jargon in these prayers. Prayers are basically, God, here's my heart, here's what I want, the end. It's kind of the the pattern of these prayers in in Ruth. And this is what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter six. In Matthew six, seven, just before he's about to teach his disciples the Lord's prayer, Jesus says something very interesting. He says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard from their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. It's interesting, there's only two types of prayers that Jesus criticizes in scripture, and long prayers are one of those types of prayers, to which many of you said, amen. But what Jesus is, is, is talking about here is people who think that they'll be heard by God because of their many words because they pray a certain amount of time or because they pray certain phrases and then, then God will hear them. And it's crazy, almost every single religion has some form of this. You know, if I, if I say enough Hail Marys, if I, if I read enough verses in the Quran, if I get into this transcendental state, you know, is God going to hear me? Did I use the right words? Am I, am I getting through? Did I, did I pray long enough? No, s- stop it. Because one thing that the book of Ruth teaches us with these prayers is that it's the simple, direct prayers that God takes and turns into unimaginable answers. Second thing I want you to notice in all three uh, of these prayers in Ruth is they took a long time. They took a long time. I know that some of you are, are waiting on God to act right now. I'm waiting on God to act right now for some things. And let's be honest, often we want God to do things in a certain amount of time, in a certain time frame, and and God doesn't necessarily do those things. But it's not because God doesn't love you, it's not because God's not listening to you. It's because he has a greater plan that you can't always see. Jesus said this in, in Luke chapter 11, he said, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? Look, if my, if my son comes up to me and says, Dad, can I have a chicken nugget? I'm not gonna say, all right, hold out your hand. Here's a water moccasin. I'm, I'm gonna give him a chicken nugget. It's a, it's a good gift. Just like God gives us good gifts. But think about this, if we, if we reversed it. If my son comes up to me and says, Dad, can I have a serpent? Am I gonna give him a serpent? No, I'm not gonna give him a serpent. No, buddy, you, you can't have a serpent. Oftentimes, what looks to us like a chicken nugget is actually a water moccasin. And what looks like a water moccasin is actually a chicken nugget. And I know that sounds really weird kind of saying it out loud, but hopefully you understand what I'm saying here. (laughs) And I know that doesn't answer all your questions. I know that doesn't come to scratch the surface on a lot of things. But one thing I would remind you of is the word that Jesus used and taught us to start every single prayer with when he taught us the the Lord's prayer, Father. My kids ask me for a lot of things. Some things I give, some things I don't. But I'm always looking for their good. So much more with God with you. Let's go home on this one. We're at the end of the book of Ruth. We're finishing it up. And here's the message of Ruth 4. Again, that no matter who you are, no matter how you came in here today, 
no matter what darkness, no matter what, what difficulty you're walking through that you're facing, the message of Ruth is this, that God can redeem it, that his plans are for your good and they're greater than anything you could ever see or imagine. And the reality of providence will help us see that. The reality of prayer will help us see that. But friends, I'm gonna be honest with you. You will never see that God's plans are for your good until you personally know the God who works through providence and works through prayer. Yeah, maybe you'll try to believe in providence. You'll try to pray. You'll try to do it in your own strength, but eventually you're going to run out of gas. And God knows that. So the whole book of Ruth, it all points, it all ends with, it, it, it points toward the child of renown in Bethlehem. It all points toward the child who's going to be born. It all points to the true redeemer. It all points to Jesus. The book of Ruth, is, it, it's not about trying to be righteous like Ruth. It's not about trying to be brave like Boaz. It's about looking to Jesus, the truer and greater Ruth. Because see, like Ruth, Jesus, he left his home to come to ours. Like Ruth, Jesus set aside his life so that we could have life. But here's what Jesus said. Jesus didn't just say, where you go, I'll go. Where you die, I'll die. No, Jesus looked at you, he looked at me and said, I won't even let death part me from you. I will die so that we can't be separated. And my friends, until you know Jesus, you won't see it. You won't have the joy to push through the pain. You won't have the courage to get up when you fall because you don't yet know the God who endured the pain of the cross so you could have the joy of life. You don't know the God who picks you up every single time you fall. But you can. Got to baptize my oldest son today. And my heart is full because of that. Something that I, I, I tell him probably every single day as we're driving to school, I, I ask him this question. I say, Luke, how, how many times does the righteous man fall? And he's like, seven. I say, yeah, buddy, the righteous man falls seven times. It's Proverbs 24, 16, by the way. The righteous man falls seven times. I'm relentless in asking him that question. I, I'm drilling this into his head because yeah, days like this, they're special. Days like this when you enter the waters of baptism and your church affirms what they see that God has done to save you, it's a special day, it's an amazing day, but there's going to be dark days. And y'all know this. There's going to be difficult seasons. You're going to fall. But the righteous person, the person who knows Jesus, they know that you fall seven times. If you're at North Park and you see somebody fall, your first thought, if they fall once, you're like, ooh, sorry, that's terrible. Second time, depending on your level of empathy, you may pull out your phone and film it. <laughs> Third time, like, there might be something wrong here. Fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh time, I should call the paramedics. You fall down seven times, your life is characterized by falling. And the righteous person knows this. The righteous person knows that they're going to fall again and again and again and again, but the righteous man knows that he is not defined by his failures. He's defined by the Savior who picks him up every single time. Friends, there will be dark days. There will be difficult seasons. You're going to fall. But the mark of the person who knows Jesus is that your identity is not in your falls. It's in the providential, prayer-answering God who picks you up every single time. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you pick us up every single time. Thank you for the book of Ruth. I'm asking you, Lord, that you would teach us more of who you are through this book. Oh Lord, if there's someone in here who needs to know you, I pray that this is the day.
In Jesus' name, amen.